Hey there you guys, welcome to the Holy Shed. It's great to have you here in what I often call the littlest parish in Christendom, where we may not be big, but we're small. And you know, that phrase or motto, which I sometimes use about the shed, actually originated with one of Canada's best love radio presenters, passed away now, but um, an amazing guy called Stuart McLean, who was known for his enchanting short stories. And probably uh, his best known character in all his stories was someone called Dave, which I think is a pretty good name, really. Uh, he was the owner of the Vinyl Cafe, the smallest record store in the world, which had this crazy but beautiful strapline, we may not be big but were small. Which, you know, to some ears may sound daft, really. I suppose in a way it is daft. But actually, I reckon it's the kind of riddle that Jesus might have spun, you know, on the shores of Galilee, to say something like, don't think that the only way to change the world is by being big and powerful. You can make a difference, even when you feel tiny and powerless and insignificant. You may not be big, but you're small. And, you know... There are advantages to being small, as the uh, environmental uh, economist E.E. E. Schumacher famously said long ago in the title of his wonderful little groundbreaking book, Small is Beautiful, and, you know, may just be the key for saving the planet. That's what he was saying way back then. And speaking of Canada, thanks again to so many people who have sent love and condolences over the past couple of weeks concerning the death of my lovely brother Fred. Last Sunday night I took part in an online memorial for him and uh, as you probably know he lived in Canada for many years and uh, it was an amazing very moving time. I mean when we logged on and, and Fred's picture came up <laughs> both Pat and I just cracked up that was more than enough so anyway thank you very much for all of your love and uh, your well wishes to me and to the to Fred's family about that now as we begin by lighting a candle uh, this week as usual I need to mention a couple of people because Angie asked if we could light a candle for her Gambian friend Kasu or Korsu who had an accident on his bike back in Gambia and uh, is in terrible pain and with, uh, you know, a lack of really good medical resources, um, you know, it's not good and, and could have a really bad outcome for him. So we're lighting the candle for him. And my pal Dave, Dave Mellows, asks if we would light a candle for Ollie uh, and for Ollie's 14-year-old daughter, Millie, who is seriously ill and um and ollie's wife also has a chronic kidney condition so you know lots to uh to 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 feel uh compassion towards uh, ollie and his family there also i'd like to light the candle for the family and friends of flavia she was a pupil in the school where regular shedster anthony is the head teacher and sadly flavia died uh recently aged seven um devastating obviously her family and uh, and the staff and the school and and her, and her school friends there anthony says that uh breaking the news to flavia's class rates as one of the hardest things he's have ever had to do so loads of pain in these stories and maybe you have your own pain right now so uh, if you've got a candle handy i invite you to light it and let's just take a moment of quiet to reach out in our hearts to these people that I've mentioned, but to others that you may want to reach out to as well. And this is a serenity time, a serenity prayer for dark times. God grant us serenity to embrace hope in dark times, courage to reach out for help instead of suffering alone, and wise assurance that all things shall pass. Amen. Amen. So last time in the shed, I showed you this 
stunning picture of the Annunciation by the African-American artist Henry Osawa Tanner. And uh, he painted in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And I mentioned that he actually took the decision to depart America to live a lot of his life in uh, and to work in Paris, in Europe, where he felt that he could be simply known as an artist instead of a Negro artist, as he was labelled back home. And, you know, uh, this is actually... a. Here in the Holy Shed, um, what we're trying to do during Advent is to use art to do just this, to affirm the dignity of human beings, to affirm our own dignity, our value and worth as people. So today, uh, I'm going to continue along this line by focusing on a couple more, what I would see as Advent paintings by Henry Osawa Tanner that, uh, that just drive home this point. And then I'll finish uh, with some incredible wisdom and compassion from a favourite rock singer of mine. So let's begin with another of Tanner's many paintings of Mary. And it's another beautiful, beautiful image. But what's unusual about this is that it portrays, portrays a pre-annunciation scene. There's no angel Gabriel here, no shining light as with that last beautiful painting. Indeed, the whole picture here is really quite dark, uh, lit only by the lamp in Mary's hand. In the Annunciation painting, the room is beautifully colourful and warm and bathed in light, but here Mary, who is again sitting on her bed, is engulfed in a sort of gloom with no divine intrusion. And yet, she's equally attentive here as in the other painting, showing no fear, no panic or trepidation while she awaits the angel's appearance. It may be dark, this painting, but it's still quite exquisite, I think. And interestingly, this scene isn't part of the biblical narrative, is it? It's a piece of visual midrash. You remember midrash? We've talked about it in the shed. It's the, a Jewish approach to interpreting scripture that focuses, instead of just on the surface story, focuses on the cracks in the text. In other words, the absences or silences, the bits of the story that are not mentioned, the gaps in the narrative or the voices which are unheard. It's an imaginative way of interpreting scripture that brings the story right into the world of the artist as well as, of course, the, the onlooker. And this is what Henry is doing in this picture. He painted it during a particularly difficult and challenging time in his life. The painting's actually commonly known as Mary 1914. He did do quite a lot of pictures of Mary, and this is called Mary 1914, because obviously it was painted in 1914. Not only the year of his mother's tragic death, which was gloom enough itself, but also when World War I broke out, uh, the events of which forced... Henry and his family to flee France for Britain. So we can understand the darkness. You know, like every work of art, it reveals as much about the world of the painter as it does the events that it's portraying. And in that sense, 
you know, you could say that every real work of art is in fact an act of hermeneutics. It's a, an act of interpreting. The picture, this picture is about waiting. It's about waiting, watching, hoping. And this speaks powerfully into our world too, doesn't it? A world plunged into further uncertainty and darkness through the pandemic, uh, but also through the climate crisis and all kinds of uh, of political conflict and unrest. There's a lot of darkness in our world right now. It may also speak into our personal dark nights of the soul, the pain of loss and bereavement, of illness perhaps, uh, of anxiety or fear or disappointment or whatever other kind of suffering. Henry Osawa Tanner saw Mary, he said, as a symbol of faith and fortitude, which is what the picture not only portrays, but invites us to participate in. That's the, the thing that it, the works of art do. They draw us into the content of the picture. And uh, perhaps by the image of Mary holding a lamp in her hand, the artist is saying that in dark times, we must find the light of God for ourselves, find the light of God within ourselves. Even in the darkest of experiences, there's always an inner light if we can find it, if we can own it. Um, Paul McCartney, uh, another famous artist, <laughs> he's revealed that Mother Mary, in his song Let It Be, is in fact his own mother who died of breast cancer when Paul was 14. But, you know, it's hard also, isn't it, to ignore the reference to Mary of Nazareth in the song's very title, Let It Be. Those are her words. Let it be unto me according to your word. Paul's mother, who was called Mary, appeared to him in a dream, he said, when he was passing through a really difficult, anxious time. It was when the Beatles were breaking up. And basically, uh, Mother Mary said to him, let it be, uh, chill, Paul, it'll be OK. And that's, you know, where that song comes from. And perhaps Mary of Nazareth is saying something similar to us all, has been saying it through the ages, really. In our hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of us, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. I've said before, I think uh, popular religion and church dogma often strips Mary of her humanity, turns her into, you know, this, this model of virginal idealism that isolates her and separates her from, from normal womanhood or indeed normal humanity. But I love, you know, the figure of Mary in the Gospels, one of my favourite characters. Most of all, I love her example of you know, profound alignment with the divine spirit. <clears throat> Let it be. That isn't sort of mere acquiescence. It isn't some kind of, you know, dehumanizing sort of statement of obedience. It's it's a statement of coalition, you know, of co-aligning, <clears throat> excuse me, of alignment with the life force, God's spirit. Um, I also love the resilience and the fortitude of Mary that is mediated through, through the painting we've been looking at. But let me show you another picture of Mary by um, the same artist. Um, and this is a beautiful nativity picture with just mother and child in the room. It's another really beautiful painting. Actually, you know, Henry used his own wife as the model for this painting and the room again is a very simple Palestinian space as I told you last week he went to Palestine um, for a while and that's where some of these paintings arose he actually did it in spaces there and you can see it's an ordinary Palestinian room as I say with a carpet not unlike one that we bought on the West Bank uh, a couple of years ago the scene is now bathed in beautiful light and yet Mary's face reveals apprehension as well as devotion as she looks at uh, the cradle. We can't see the baby. What we see only is the shroud, which seems to me very powerfully to point toward the child's ultimate fate. 
uh, even as he lies there peacefully. So as Mary pondered these things, as if feeling the nick of a sword piercing her own heart, even as she treasures her little baby. But what I'd like you to notice here is the halo. Can you see the halo over the sleeping baby? I mean, it's quite unlike any halo that I've ever seen before. Um, you know, usually halos are represented in a kind of like a cutout on the head of the figure that's there. But here it hovers over his head. I mean, almost sci-fi like to me, something from Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? To me, this is the symbol of the child's blessedness, which was expressed verbally uh, later on by the heavenly voice at the baptism in the Gospels, the story of his baptism. This is my son, the beloved. Now, whether you interpret that as being an actual audible voice, which I don't personally, but I think it, I, I can definitely see it as the voice that was speaking within Jesus, you know, that was affirming him uh, as he set out on his on his work and his life and his ministry. You know, you are my son, the beloved. But I also sense this same blessedness in Henry Osawatana's sense of certainty that he said he had, that he, like anyone else, is a blessed child of God. It's all rather wonderful, I think. Now, I'm not detracting at all from the decisive presence of God in Jesus when I say that every child is a child of God. You know, in a lovely poem called The Circle of a Girl's Arms, Carol Houselander writes this. She says, she, Mary, has laid love in his cradle. She saw this child as being the embodiment of love. She has laid love in his cradle. But then she goes on to say, in every cradle, Mary has laid her child. Wow. In each comes Christ, she says. In each, Christ comes to birth. I mean, oh my goodness, I love that. The thought that, you know, this blessedness, this Christ child um, is represented in every child that is born into the world. I mean, you know, don't you? I, I, I believe in original blessing, not original sin. I believe that we were born, that every child is born in blessedness, that whatever else happens in our life, whatever decisions we make, good or bad, um, there is a blessedness at the core of our being. And I think there's a blessedness at the core of every being. And the choice we have is whether, you know, to come home to that, to connect with that blessedness, or indeed to neglect it and to go in quite other directions. And um, that, so, it's, you know, in the same way that the circle of blessedness hovers over the child in the picture, blessedness attends my life, attends your life too. And the important journey, as I say, in life, I think, is to come home to that blessedness, to connect with what the Quakers call, you know, the Christ within, the light of God within. Too often we allow other influences to overshadow us instead of the blessedness of our essential worth and dignity as human beings, as, as children of God. And that blessedness isn't just kind of a spiritual thing. You know, what I want to tell you today, dear friends, is that, you know, your whole being is blessed body, mind and spirit. And yes, I did say body, mind and spirit. Your body, uh, with all its hungers, appetites and instincts, also houses blessedness. Your body is a temple of the spirit, Paul says. Something to love and nurture, not fight against, as some so-called Christian teaching tells us. So, you know, your whole humanity is a place of blessedness. The ring, the sacred ring, hangs over you too, over every part of you. So on that note, uh, I want to finish by telling you about an amazing exchange of correspondence between a 16-year-old woman uh, called Barbara 
and the rock singer Nick Cave, one of my favourites, of course. And um, she wrote publicly to Nick Cave saying how bad she felt about herself. This is what she wrote. She said, I can't see anything positive in my body. I hate to look at myself in a mirror. Uh, and it makes me suffer a lot, she said. I feel like everyone is better than me, even though I did very important things for being just 16 years old. How should I behave, she asks him. You know, what should I do for myself? Thank you for a possible answer, she wrote. Well, Nick Cave uh, thanked her for entrusting him with such a courageous and, and heartfelt question, which he said took him back to his own uh, nightmarish teenage years, lived inside the, the pitiless mirror, he says. Spending so many nights in hotel rooms, he told her, he still finds himself, even now, standing in front of angled mirrors and merciful lighting. You know all that, don't you, in hotel rooms. Uh, feeling at his most defenceless and exposed, watching the mirror do its worst. Um, he says, I often wonder how much accumulated misery a hotel mirror contains. Wow. As it reflects back what it appears to, what appears to be our essential self. But of course, he says, what the mirror projects is not our true self at all, only our reflected outer shell. And what's virtually impossible to see within a mirror, he says, is that the very essence of our humanness, our vulnerability, our fragility, is the most beautiful thing we possess. The problem is, Nick Cave says, that vulnerability can appear to us as shame or weakness as we attempt to break, embrace us, to brace ourselves against what feels like a brutal, unforgiving and judgmental world. But those of us um, who have no awareness, those people who have no awareness of their own fragility, who present themselves as overconfident, uh, armoured up and invulnerable, Nick Cave says, sacrifice the essence of what makes them both human and beautiful. I mean, wow. I mean, wow, wow, wow. I don't know of another rock musician who, you know, responds to one of his fans, a 16-year-old girl, as if she were his daughter in that way, with such wisdom and compassion. And he goes on to say that vulnerability is like the engine of compassion and can be a superpower, a special vision that allows us to see what he calls the quivering, wounded inner world that most of us possess. And, uh, and he finishes by saying, Barbara, please take care of yourself. Seek out beautiful things, inspirations, connections and validating friends at all costs. He says, try to cultivate a sense of humour. See things through that courageous heart of yours. Be kind to yourself. Be kind. And that's just wonderful, isn't it? And, uh, you know, I th so I think in his own way, Nick is perceiving what I'm calling this blessedness, that ring of blessedness that hovers over all of us, though we can't see it, which is part of, of who we are uh, inside. A lot to contemplate there, isn't there, guys? And uh, in these pictures and in these wonderful words of Nick Cave, what, you know, breaks my heart is how hard some people can be on themselves i've found it over and over and over again I, how many times i've said you're being too hard on yourself sometimes people you know can be so forgiving of others but unable to forgive what they perceive are the wrongs within themselves you know sometimes placing the, the worst interpretations on their own thoughts and actions whilst being generous in the way they interpret other people you know giving themselves so little slack. I mean, like Barbara, she uh, fitted into that, didn't she? And sometimes, like her, you know, people can be despising and battling with their own bodies when inside them, inside of all of us, lives this blessedness. You know, Mary has placed her child in every cradle, in every heart, inside of each of us, is this voice, if only we can hear it, saying, you, you, you are my beloved. To me, you know, personally, I sometimes hear the voice say, Dave, you're not perfect, you know, but perfection's overrated. <laughs> you sometimes screw up. You get things wrong. 
make poor judgments, jump to conclusions. But you, Dave, you are my beloved. In you, in the you that you are in your heart, I'm well pleased. And I think that's, you know, something to really contemplate through this Advent period. Not just the birth of Christ 2,000 years ago in a manger and that whole story that we're very familiar with, beautiful as it is, but perhaps to be contemplating the prospect <coughs> of Christ being born in each of us. So I implore you, dear friends, uh, take a little time to ponder these things because, listen, you are God's beloved too. Believe it for God's sake, for your sake, believe it. You are God's beloved. So let's have a prayer. God, who is love, when we look around the world, we see you everywhere. In a simple kindness from a stranger, in the compassionate dedication of health workers in the NHS, in milky sunshine over a city park, a promise that sometime soon clouds will break open again. But most of all, we see you in the patience and resilience of those who will not let us go, even when we despair of ourselves. Oh, may our inner eyes be kind and reassuring to the heart that beats in our own breast. And may we see that you are not far away, elsewhere, but enfleshed in the fabric of who we are, in the quivering frailness of our sometimes broken humanity, as well as the beauty that we find so hard to embrace or acknowledge. God, who is love, help us, we pray, to befriend ourselves. Amen. Okay, it's time for a toast, I think. So if you have a drink handy, pour it now or grab a hold of it. And let's make a toast. A toast to hope and anticipation. You know, may these last days of Advent still work their magic and help us to Expect to find the shining light of Christ, the Christ child, round every corner, in every barn or garden shed, um, in every painful experience, every setback, every disappointment, and every joyful reunion, every new opportunity. Christ is born again and again and again in our world, in our hearts, to life. Lachaim. Fantastic. Hey, if you uh, like the shed, you like what I'm doing here, you can support us by uh, buying us a coffee. You can use this wonderful coffee site to, uh, to buy us a coffee or two. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much, lovely people, for you know the lots and lots of coffees that you buy us and you bought us over, over the last year or two. We thank you very much for that. And just to flag up the fact that um, I mentioned that there would be a, a sort of carry-on Enneagram day, a more kind of advanced Enneagram day in the new year. Well, I'm just flagging the date up to you right now. It's the 19th of March. More of that later. But 19th of March, Saturday, is when we'll have uh, another Enneagram day. And also this week, there is another soul space coming thick and fast just before Christmas. <laughs> There's a soul space which is entitled Nativity for a Troubled World, which uh, I'll be doing with the help of our lovely friends in Croydon. So that is on Thursday of this coming week at seven o'clock. And I'll put up links on uh, on Facebook for you to find. So we finish with a blessing. The blessing of God, the eternal goodwill of God, the shalom and salam of God the wildness and warmth of God be among us and between us now and always. Amen. Well, there it is, guys. Uh, I'm going to leave it there this week. Thank you so much for being with me. Um, I hope that you go well through this week. Stay safe out there. Uh, be kind to people around you. Be kind to yourselves. Uh, that most underrated virtue of kindness. 
Uh, stay human, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.